This conference. Okay, so starting with the usual disclosures and acknowledgements, we have gone through this before also. Now, from where we finished off last time, let's proceed further and uh, we'll start with how to investigate the gallbladder pathologies. And starting with the basic, and that is the plain skygram of the abdomen, how is it informative as far as the gallbladder is concerned? It tells you a lot of things. Number one, 15 percent of gallstones are radioopaque only 15 percent compare this with the renal stones where 85 percent of them are radioopaque so here's only 15 percent is radioopaque number two you can find evidence of radiolucent gas trapped in a stone as a triradiate fissure which is known as the mercedes benz sign we'll show you in the next slide or a biradiate fissure known as the seagull sign or you can find gas trapped in the gallbladder wall uh, not in the lumen, in the wall. And that's usually seen in emphysematous acute cholecystitis, where the severity leads to accumulation of gas inside the lumen and the edema of the wall leads to breach of the mucosa, mucosal ulcerations, and then the gas creeps in into the wall, giving rise to the typical champagne sign or the fibrescent sign. So here you find gas lying in the layers of the wall of the gallbladder. Or you can find gas in the bile ducts, what is known as pneumobilia which could either be atrogenic after uh, operation, uh, after uh, a post-operative phenomena, like for example, after cholidocoentric fistula, or you can have a cholidocoduodenal anastomosis, other condition. So you can have gas inside the stone, you can have gas inside the gallbladder wall, you can have gas inside the uh, extra biliary hepatic channel or the intrahepatic biliary channel for that matter. Number two, number three rather, the first was the radiopaque CT of the stones, second was the radiolucent gas. Now number three is an opaque gallbladder. Now, when can the gallbladder shadow be seen clearly? One, you have excess calcium inside, like for example, milk of calcium, which is calcium carbonate and phosphate, what is known as the limi uh, bile, and gives rise to what is known as the limi gallbladder. Or you can have porcelain gallbladder, where the calcium is deposited in the wall of the, of the, uh, of the gallbladder. So here, this is important. Why? Because it's a pre-malignant condition and uh, converts into malignancy in almost 5 to 10 percent cases. So this calcification of the wall appears as a blue discoloration and makes the gallbladder wall very, very brittle. A usually an incidental finding on multiple different imaging modalities. It is usually asymptomatic. That's why it's an incidental finding. And then, of course, the sentinel loop can also be seen on a plain skygram of the abdomen related to gallbladder pathology, like for example, acute cholecystitis, where the adjacent part of the transverse colon is uh, shows decreased peristaltic activity or localized area of pyletic eyes. This is what we are talking about, the Mercedes-Benz sign. If you see this carefully, you will find the Mercedes-Benz sign here. See they are trapped inside the stone, there is a Mercedes-Benz sign. Uh, you can find the emphysematous cholecystitis, see the emphysematous cholecystitis, where you find the gas bubbles like in a champagne glass. Or you can find the porcelain gallbladder here, see the, the wall which is calcified. Or you can find pneumobilia in the common bile duct. You can see the gas uh, marked with the arrow. Now, coming to the second investigation, which is the gold standard for gallbladder pathology, and we all know it. Yes, you have guessed it correctly. It is the ultrasound examination, which can be done transabdominally or it can be done endoscopically. Now, let's see what are the salient features of an ultrasound. Why it's known as a gold standard? Number one, it is 96% diagnostic for gallbladder and common bile duct pathologies, except the retrodural part of the common bile duct which is an area, which is a blind area for the ultrasound. Number two tells you about the gallbladder size. It tells you the gallbladder, uh, gallbladder wall thickness. What is important about the thickness? The importance is that anything more than four millimeter is pathological as far as the gallbladder thickness is, wall thickness is concerned. And so uh, forms a very important uh, additive uh, point in favor of uh, acute cholestitis or chronic cholestitis where the wall has thickened to a great extent. It tells you about the stones, it tells you about the polyps. Number three, the ultrasound tells you about the extra hepatic biliary channels, especially the common bile duct, which should be less than six millimeters as a normal in an adult. Remember, this is also age related. You go above six years, it can go up to seven millimeter, eight millimeters. Uh, that means more than six millimeters. So this is age related. The normal adult should be less than six millimeters. Anything more than six millimeters becomes pathological. It is not a very good investigation for the common bile duct yet. 
it can tell you about the stones in the CBD. It can tell you about a growth in the CBD. But it's not an absolute uh, feature of a of a uh, ultrasound diagnosis of a CBD. It tells you about the pancreatic head. It tells you about the porcelain gallbladder, the thin rim of calcification. It substantiates the finding of a plain scagger on the abdomen. It is very very informative in acute cholecystitis. And what are you looking for in acute cholecystitis? You're looking for pericholecystic collections. You're looking for the Murphy sign. We'll talk about that when we talk about egg cholecystitis. You're looking for hydrops, which is an enlarged gallbladder and with non-compressibility. Usually what is seen in the mucosal or empyema of the gallbladder. Impacted stone, Mersey syndrome, and emphysematous acute cholestatin. As far as the stone disease is concerned, we just now said the gallbladder stones. You look for the wall eco-shadow triad, which is a well-defined ecogenic gallbladder wall that stands for W. Echo echoes from stones immediately beneath the wall, that is the E, and posterior acoustic shadows, acoustic shadows, shadowing caused by strong echoes from stone, the gallbladder fossa, that is the SV. <clears throat> it tells you about the gallbladder growth. All signs on plain skygram can be confirmed on ultrasound. These are some of the ultrasound images. This is basically the WES, WES, that is what you're looking at. Then ultrasound scan liver gallbladder showing a thickened gallbladder wall. See the thickness of the gallbladder wall, and then of course a gallbladder mark. So these are some of the images picked up from ultrasound. Now coming to the next investigation, that's hepatobiliary synthesis scan, which can usually be done with 99 M technetium HEDA scan, or one of the the modifications of the immunodiacetic HIDA stands for hepatic immunodiacetic acid scan, or one of the uh, chemical modifications that the PPDA scan or the IOD does scan, but the most common, of course, is the HEDA scan. The dye, it is important to remember when does the dye reach the various parts of the biliary channel. CBD within five minutes, duodenum 10 to 15 minutes, but see the gallbladder. Gallbladder reaches later. Why? Because it has to go from the cystic duct into the gallbladder, get concentrated, and only then it's going to opacify the gallbladder. So normally 90% of the dye can be seen in the gallbladder within 30 minutes and 100% in one hour. If the gallbladder is not visualized, then it is basically a diagnosis in favor of a block of the cystic duct, which is usually a feature of acute cholestatin. But there is a catch to it, and that is intravenous morphine administration can improve the accuracy of this scan and tells you about the, the resistance to the sphincter foci increases and the dye is pushed into the uh, gallbladder. So we talk about those borderline cases of cystic block where with the help of morphine, you can identify dye reaching into the gallbladder, which negates the finding of an acute cholecystitis. Because an acute cholecystitis, one of the primary events to occur is a block at the cystic duct, either with a calculus, what is known as calculus cholecystitis, or without a calculus with the edema of the cystic duct, known as a calculus cholecystitis. So if you're getting dye inside the gallbladder, it is against the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. Then it reaches the bowel in one hour. When is it indicated? As I said earlier, acute cholestitis. Number two, demonstrates patency of intrabiliary anastomosis. post cholestectomy leaks indicates the amount of leak. The next scan is the CT scan, which is one of the best methods of delineating the common bile duct pathologies, whether you have a stone or a malignancy. Role to define staging of all better cancer is again very important the CT scan. We are looking at the various lymph nodes, and these lymph nodes in the hepatic area, lymph nodes in the peritocal area, lymph nodes in the celiac axis, and other lymph nodes. And the hepatic and pancreatic lesions can easily be seen. And of course, the other lymph nodal status can be defined, and that is important for staging a gallbladder cancer. The MRI as MRCP equals ERCP. So basically, this is one of the better methods of visualizing because it's uh, absolutely non-invasive method. And we are looking at uh, delineating the whole anatomical <clears throat> view of the extra intrahepatic biliary channel, which is akin to a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram without intervention. Defines the total biliary channel. Anatomy is very clearly defined. The PTC, which is a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram, the prerequisite says number one, serum bilirubin should be more than 9 milligram per cent. You should have a normal coagulation profile. It is a blind or it can be done fluoroscopically, or it can be ultrasound guided. What is really done is you put in a needle in one of the dilated biliary channels, you inject dye into the biliary channel, and you have the complete opacification of the intrahepatic, extrahepatic biliary channel. 
So either the, dye, the, the needle point can be introduced blindly or it can be under fluoroscopic control or ultrasound guided. Normally, the needle should be picked in the 9th, 10th intercostal spaces selected in the mid axillary line to puncture the, the liver and the biliary channel. And a PTC is also therapeutic when it becomes PTBT, which is percurrence transhepatic biliary drainage, usually required when you have a portahepatitis block. Nothing is going beyond the portahepatitis, so the whole of the intrahepatic biliary channel has been dilated. The patient gets obstructive jaundice. You want to relieve the jaundice. You just put in a, a tube in one of the intrahepatic biliary channels, especially in the left side, and you have a, a drainage through a PTC. Usually required in any kind of uh, portahepatitis pathology, like, for example, malignancy, like Glatzkin's tube. Then ERCP, that's diagnostic and therapeutic both. That is the advantage of ERCP over MRCP. You can take a biopsy of a growth in that particular area. You can uh, even do a stenting so that you can relieve the obstructive jaundice. So that is where it scores over MRCP. It is both therapeutic and diagnostic, while MRCP is purely diagnostic. A perioperative cholangiogram helps in difficult callus dissection. You're doing a, a callus dissection laparoscopically, uh, and you're not able to visualize uh, the callus area, where is the cystic duct, where is the cornopatic duct, and you have a problem that probably I may be injuring. You can do a perioperative cholangiogram, make a nick in the CBD, push in a colidocoscope, and visualize the whole of the biliary channel. But then that is time consuming, costly and difficult technically. So usually not a common practice in all uh, across all uh, OTs uh, across the world. But what is probably better is now a new method, which is known as the near infrared scan. That is the NIR scan. This is the NIR scan. And what does it use? Uh, it uses iodocyanogreen. So that is indocyanogreen or cyanogreen green is basically injected. And when you inject it intravenously, it reaches the biliary channel within 20 to 30 minutes. And the whole thing opacifies. So you can clearly visualize the whole of the biliary, extra biliary channel. You can see the cystic duct. You can see the gallbladder possibly. You can see the CHD always, the CVD always. So you can go ahead and do the dissection. So that helps in the dissection. So that is visualizing per operative visualization, either through a colidoscope, but it's per operative cholangiography, and number two, per operative. Uh, Indocyanogreen uh, near infrared radiography. You can do a T tube cholangiogram. You put in a T tube before removal the, removing the T tube. You have to be sure that the CVD is patent. The dye has reached into the intestine. So you have to put in a dye through the T tube or the T tube cholangiogram. And then, of course, FNAC, which is required for uh, metastasis or mets from a gallbladder cancer or rarely a uh, local extension into segment four and five of cars from a gallbladder, you can take FNAC. Now, just mentioning two investigations which are now redundant, I will not be wasting time on them. One is what is known as the oral cholecystography, which is the mainstay of diagnosis when we were studying in 80s because ultrasound has still not had still not come in in a major way. So we are relying more on all this, uh, oral cholecystography. But the problem with OCG was that it has very low sensitivity and specificity of less than 50%. That's why it fell into disrepute. IV cholangiography has now been taken over by peroperative cholangiogram or NIR ICG. So these are two investigations which are initially done but no longer done anymore. I just mentioned them, you should know that. Congenital anatomical abnormalities, two are very important. One is the colidocal cyst, the other is atresia of the bile duct. Let's look at what colidocal cyst is all about. This is basically a condition in which you have a congenital malformation. The hypothesis is that, that along with the congenital malformation responsible for the weakness of the duct wall, there is also distal duct obstruction. So it is a bipronged attack on the extra biliary channel and possibly in a very small percentage of cases, the intra biliary channel also, where a combination of weakness with distal obstruction leads to formation of cysts. When these cysts fill up, they cause resultant compression of CVD and intermittent filling up causes intermittent symptomatology. The usual age group, 60% of them would be diagnosed before 10 years. So this is uh, uh, the pre-pubertal age group is the most common to be involved and females are the most common uh, uh, sex group to be involved. The cysts are usually anywhere from 3 to 25 centimeters in diameter. The characteristic thing is that the cyst wall, just like the extrapatic biliary channel wall, does not have 
or has very sparse smooth muscle fibers internal lining cyst is a columnar cyst the problem with the cyst is the risk of malignancy in 11% of cases so how do you classify it if you look at the classification the classification is what we follow is a todani's classification there is the long mass modification of todani's classification and this todani's classification classifies it into basically five types type 1 2 3 and 4 and if you look at the most common it is type 1 1a 1b 1c you can see the extra mandibular channel so you have a cystic dilatation you have a sacular dilatation or you have fusiform dilatation and what is important with fusiform dilatation is it also involves the part adjacent to the pancreatic duct this is the part adjacent to the pancreatic duct so that is one area right then you got type 2 type 3 4a 4b and 5 you just look it up i've given a very good diagram for you so 90% it is type 1 and a type 6 was added by longmire which says it has got a number of uh, diverticuli so this is resembling what we know as uh, the the isolated diverticuli uh, diverticuli that you have look at type 2 you have a diverticulum so if you have multiple diverticul diverticulums then it becomes a longmire type of colitical cyst now the characteristic feature apart from the sex and age group is the triad of symptoms and the triad of symptoms is pain jaundice and lump the pain is severe colicky on the right hypochondrium or on the epigastrium or maybe dull or a constant pain jaundice obstructive intermittent now obstructive intermittent i told you the symptomatologies intermittent and you have differentiated in a infant newborn infant from biliary atresia palpable lump in the right hypochondrium epigastrium is usually found you have associated fever weight loss anorexia because of recurrent attacks of cholangitis the investigations which help you to diagnose of course the main stage is an ultrasound and a ct scan you can go in for mrcp biochemical investigation to substantiate the claim that the patient has obstructive jaundice a i131 rose bengal scan is highly diagnostic barium studies may be uh, indicated but usually not indicated sequelae of colitical cyst apart from the fact that you have carcinoma in 11% of cases chances of carcinoma 11% the other sequelae is recurrent cholangitis you can have a spontaneous rupture the prolonged effect of a colitical cyst leading to complete biliary obstruction can lead to secondary biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension and portal hypertension incidentally can also be because of the pressure effect on the portal vein so how do you treat it early treatment is indicated and complete surgical resection there is only one treatment and that is complete cyst excision cyst bypass is no longer an option why see if you do a cystic bypass you have four times higher chances of having malignancy as far as a cyst excision is concerned so no longer recommended so you have only one method of treating it and that is cyst excision and reconstruction how do you do that if you have elenzo ledge type 1 that's prodromal modification of elenzo ledge al is elenzo ledge classification so you have a colidoco entrostomy with a roux en y procedure you can do a excision of the diverticulum or you can do a transdural excision of the cyst wall so as to create a wide opening into the duodenum right coming to the second and that is the congenital biliary atresia incidence 1 is to 10000 to 1 is 12000 male female is equal as compared to colidocal where female was more common you have surgical correction as early as possible is the main stay of therapy why for the simple reason that this is a inflammatory disease which is dynamic in nature and progressive after birth this is a very important part so it is a congenital malformation no doubt but a super added inflammatory uh, Uh, disease uh, inflammatory process is always there and that makes the disease a dynamic so with the passive time more and more part of the extra pedicular channel undergoes atresia so you're really looking at incidence a uh, 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 surgical correction as early as possible i told you the reason now right so if you don't treat it biliary cirrhosis portal hypertension death before 3 years of age see this this is very important so the child dies early so there is some evidence to suggest that apart from the fact that it is a congenital malformation with super added inflammation of the extra mandibular channel the suggestion is that the colidocal cysts the biliary atresia neonatal hepatitis are probably stages of a single disease process the same disease process 
probably leads to a number of changes. Now, the congenital medullary atresia, unfortunately, unfortunately, the most common type is the non-correctable type. So this is type three, where you got see everything is atretic. The intrapatibular channel, the extrapatibular channel, everything is atretic. Only the gallbladder thin stream is seen, uh, a thin streak like gallbladder is seen. So non-correctable 90% of cases, and that's why it is very important that the child should be operated as soon as diagnosed. That's immediately after birth. And what should you do? You should look at the extra hepatic uh, biliary channel at the hilum because that's the point where you may be able to find some amount of patent extra hepatic biliary channel. Unfortunately, the correctable part where you can do an astomosis very easily, you can do polydoco uh, jejunostomy here, you can do polydoco jejunostomy here, is only available in 10% of patients, right? 25% of these patients have associated congenital heart disease, dural atresia, imperforate anus, mongolism, or urinary tract abnormalities, which are basically mesodermal abnormalities. The typical presentation is jaundice, one third jaundice at birth. See, 33% are born with jaundice, and all will have jaundice by the end of first week. So, 100% jaundice at the end of first week. That is the hallmark of this disease process. Progressive in nature, I just not told you. Why? Because inflammation keeps on progressing. Usually dark urine and clay colored stool. Rarely you can have normal colored stool depending on the degree and the duration of jaundice. The higher the jaundice, the, the longer the duration, <clears throat> the stool becomes normal. Why? Because the excretion of bile begins by the shedding cells of the distal mucosa, which incidentally are one of the most rapidly multiplying uh, epithelial uh, linings uh, secondary to skin only. So growth for one year, growth may be normal in those patients where you have the correct form, prolonged stetoria and resultant osteomalacia. The patient comes with biliary rickets, that's not biliary rickets. You have severe pruritus, the child may be having clubbing, late abdominal distension, hepatomegaly, ascites, when the child starts developing secondary biliary cirrhosis and ultimately the secondary biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension usually kills the child. So, the differential diagnosis is very important. Another cause of jaundice has to be looked into. Number one, physiological jaundice, which peaks at the uh, two to five days and maximum never goes above 10 mg percent. You can have a constitutional deficiency in the form of critical and Najjar syndrome or galactosemia. You can have hemolytic disease in the patient where the jaundice is prehepatic. You can have sepsis, which is probably one of the most important differential diagnoses. And here is most difficult to differentiate the liver and causes jaundice then you have cytomegalic disease jaundice first week or later associated with hepatomegaly splenomegaly microcephaly and mental retardation the other important are the neonatal hepatitis hepatitis dispositated bile syndrome and intrahepatic biliary hypoplasia these are the other differential diagnoses that have to be kept in mind so fluctuating jaundice you have diagnosis by liver biopsy, which shows local necrosis, that's what neonatal hepatitis is diagnosed. The inspissated bile syndrome, you have a normal biliary tract, but the bile is of very high viscosity, <coughs> and that leads to canonical destruction, and most cases are related to hemolytic jaundice. Now, coming to the, the diagnosis, you're looking at the color of the stool, you're looking at consistency of the liver, you're looking at gradually increasing serum bilirubin, you're looking at the ultrasound, uh, which helps you to diagnose. A duodenal fluid aspirate will show that there is no bile in it. Radioactive rose bengal test is confirmatory. It is given, uh, uh, rose bengal is given, and you test the radioactivity in the stool, and the maximum amount is 2.4% in biliary atresia, not more than that. Lipoprotein X is also present in the CNO patients with cholestasis. Diagnostic laparoscopy is both uh, diagnostic in the sense it tells you whether the patient can really be amenable to some kind of surgical intervention or how early you should go in for surgical intervention. Liver biopsy is a must. Before you go in for any kind of surgical misadventure or adventure into a patient with biliary atresia, remember a liver biopsy is a must to rule out the differential diagnosis. And radionuclide excretion scan is also an uh, option for diagnosing biliary atresia. So what do you do? The operation should be done before 10 weeks of birth. Remember that. That is the golden period. You do it before 10 weeks, you probably will be giving the patient some additional span of life. Delay causes irreparable liver damage. 
Also, an early operation is not associated with any increased mortality. You may say, how can I operate a child only 10 weeks old? No, it doesn't give rise to increased mortality. It does not result in increased mortality. It will probably save the child. After opening the abdomen, what are you looking at? First thing to be done is liver biopsy, frozen section to confirm the diagnosis and rule out hepatitis. Because I just now told you that hepatitis is one of the most important differential diagnosis of a congenital atresia. So then next, what do you do? You try to identify the gallbladder or identify the proximal most part of the patent extra pedicular channel because that's where you're going to do the anastomosis. And you do a cholangiogram to define the intrapedicular channels. If no gallbladder, then you have to dissect at the port hepatic. If you're fortunate enough, the child is fortunate enough, if the gallbladder is in communication with the proximal patent uh, extra pedicular channel, then go ahead and do anastomosis there. But if by chance the gallbladder is not palpable, then in those patients, then you have to go in for porta hepatitis dissection. And what do you do? You basically, this is done, you are anastomosing a Ruin Y loop with the glycerin capsule. With the glycerin capsule, remember that. That is known as the Casais hepatic portoentrostomy. That's why the name portoentrostomy, Casais. With the glycerin capsule, you are anastomosing the bowel. This is the bowel which has been taken up. That's the Ru and Y. This is a Ru and Y. Ru is basically the name of the scientist and Y is a type of anastomosis. So Ru and Y, you're doing either a polycystogygenosomy if the gallbladder is there. If not, then of course you're doing a hepaticogygenosomy or else if nothing is present, which is the most common scenario, then you're doing a portoentrosomy. So you can do a cystogygenosomy if you have a patent gallbladder. If you have a patent proximal CHD, you can do hepatic or docogygenosomy. But if you have neither, you just have the porta hepatitis in front of you, then you can go ahead and do a portoentrosomy. Best results I told you, operation done before 8 to 10 weeks. Post-operative, normal cerebral is achieved the lifespan of 10 years. That means if you've never done a surgery and the patient gets a normal cerebral movement post-operatively, he or she will probably live up to 10 years. There are some of the modifications of the RU and Y. I think that's beyond your scope. That's for the PGs to understand. So the end results of biliary trees are important. post operative complications, the cholangitis in 40% patients, hepatic fibrosis of repeated cholangitis is an eventuality. Portal hypertension, 50% of survival. Liver transplantation is usually required, especially type 3 disease. Remember the type 3 disease where everything was atretic, this was the most common type, 90% non-correctable. So you have to do a liver transplantation. Failed or in a patient with failed portoentrosomy, you've done a portoentrosomy, the operation failed, then nothing is left except doing a liver transplantation. The two-year survival rate in a liver transplant is about 70 to 80%. Right? Now coming to the most important disease of the gallbladder and that is the GSD or gallbladder stone disease. Now, what are we looking at? Let's look at the routine classification based on naked eye appearance. So, we're talking about the cholesterol, the mixed stones, and the pigment stone. Now, because we know that most of the stones have got a substantial amount of cholesterol, especially the mixed and the cholesterol, so they have been grouped together. So, anything more than 50% of cholesterol, any stone more than 50% of cholesterol would be known as a cholesterol or the mixed stone. In a pigment stone, the amount of cholesterol is there, but it's less than 20 to 30%. So that is no longer grouped as a cholesterol stone. So you have the cholesterol mixed stone and pigment stone. And what is very typical is the difference in Asiatic and the European and US countries manifestation. Cholesterol is the primary stone in the Western world, 80%. And pigment is the primary stone in the Asiatic population. That is the difference. Chemical examination showed there is no demarcation between cholesterol and mix. I just not told you. Now, what is biliary sludge? Biliary sludge is now a recently, I won't say recently, but a fairly recent recognition as a cause for gallbladder pathologies, especially clinical presentation. So now we understand that the sludge is basically thick bile, very, very thick bile, just like sand. So what is it made up of? Cholesterol crystals, very obvious. Then pigment, that is the calcium bilirubate uh, granules and mucin gel matrix all together make the biliary sludge. And then, of course, the recent trend is to classify stones into, as just not only cholesterol rich, the important thing is it should be more than 50% cholesterol. And pigment stones, which are either brown or black. First, let's talk about the pigment stone. Now, if you talk about the pigment stone, the two types, these are basically the black and the brown, the black and the brown pigment stones, right? Now, 
the term pigment stone is misleading. Why? Because pigment is only 5%. 5%. And cholesterol, I just saw told you, less than 20-30%. But the major remaining part, that is about 80% or 70%, is amorphous, unidentifiable residue. And that together makes what we now know as a pigment stone. But because it has got 5% uh, of bilirubin, that's why it has been termed as uh, pigment stone. So what is the pathophysiology? Now, remember, the pathophysiology of a cholesterol stone is entirely different from a pathophysiology of a pigment stone. So in pigment stones, either excessive hemolysis or ascariasis infestation or E. coli infection uh, in the gallbladder or the CBD leading to what? Producing beta glucorinase, which hemolyzes the water-soluble bilirubin glucuronide into the insoluble bilirubin, precipitating it and giving rise to what we know as the pigment stone. The black is almost exclusively gallbladder and brown is usually primary CBD. Remember that. Black goes with the gallbladder, brown goes with the CBD. Black, brown. Now, what is black? 20%. So, these are basically inorganic. They say inorganic stone, totally. Why? It's made up of 20-30% is calcium bilirubinate, calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate, right? In non-effect, so the bilirubinate is only about 5%. The rest is calcium salt or carbonate and phosphate and the rest is cholesterol and the rest is the amorphous residue that we just not talked about. Seen in non-infected bile, hemolysis of hemolytic anemia, also in chronic alcoholics, total parental nutrition, TPN is total parental nutrition, also seen in cirrhosis and pancreatitis. The pathology, non-bacterial and non-enzymatic hydrolysis of bilirubin conjugates. That results in the formation of bilirubin anions, which then combine with calcium, giving rise to calcium carbonate, phosphate and bilirubin. Right? On the other hand, the brown goes with the CBD stones. That is an organic salt. So this was all inorganic. This is an organic salt. And why organic salt? Apart from the bilirubinate, which is here common to both, Calcium bilirubinate is common to both, both black and brown. But what is different here? The calcium stearate and the calcium palmitate. So these are the differences between the black and the brown. So one is an inorganic so, uh, stone, the other is an organic stone. So soft and earthy, the brown stone, usually associated with either stasis in the CBD, or endoprothesis in the CBD, that means the stent has been put in the CBD, forgotten, forgotten about the stent, remains for a long period of time, you have formation of a secondary CBD stone. Or E. coli or other infection, we just have talked about ascariasis, uh, the clonocus sinensis or E. coli. So all these are together, we are looking at the CBD pathology which is responsible for the formation of CBD stone. Now coming to the cholesterol stones, on the other hand, which are the, the major stones, that, is, that means the 80% in the Western world and 20% in the Asiatic world. So what is this cholesterol stone all about? For that, we have to understand the function of the bile salt and which function are we talking about? We are talking about the keeping the cholesterol or lipid in, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a stage of non-precipitation. And how does it do that? That is basically the biliary bacille which is formed. The bile salts, they got the external negative charge CO group. So these are basically their hydro... Uh, they are lipid phyllic, hydrophobic in the center. So the lipid is trapped inside. What expands this missile is the glycerol or the lecithin. So together this forms a complete missile. So you got the bile salt outside, you got the lipid trapped inside. So that keeps it in solution, right? The lecithin or the glycerol expands the missile. So it keeps the insoluble cholesterol in stable suspension. So it is not allowed to precipitate and that is how it functions, the, the bile salt function, keeping the cholesterol in suspension, right? So that is responsible for the non-precipitation. Now, when you look at the formation of gallbladder stones, then there are four sites where the problem could be there. Number one, the problem with the cholesterol metabolism. So this is supersaturated bile. The problem at the level of the gallbladder, either the formation uh, excessive nucleation or anidus formation or it could be intrahepatic circulation problem. So let's look at how these stones develop. Number one, the cholesterol stones, the cholesterol makes up more than 50% of the stone. The rest is calcium, protein debris, 
bilirubin and bile acids and compare this to the pigment stones right now the stages of formation of a cholesterol stone are simply three number one the cholesterol gets supersaturated then it gets nucleated and once the nucleus forms then the stone keeps on growing now the first is the problem of supersaturation which is really a metabolic problem so in part in part the cholesterol stone disease the gallbladder is a metabolic disease and why do we so it's a, why do we say it's a metabolic disease number one association with other disorders of metabolism number two differences in bile composition and hepatic enzyme activities from control subject and number three reversibility of these stone now what is the association of other metabolic disorders serum cholesterol is is uh, normal in these patients. Remember that, contrary to popular belief, you would say a fat person would be having a high lipid, so he would be more susceptible to a cholesterol stone formation. No, that's not true. So these stone formers usually would be having a normal serum cholesterol, but they are associated more commonly found in obese persons because of hyperinsulinism, insulinism, which leads to increased activity of the uh, HMG. Uh, CO reductase, which is involved in cholesterol synthesis, so there is increased hormone synthesis. Diabetes again, increased amount of gallstones, this is again a metabolic disease. Hypertriglyceridemia, again a metabolic disease, increased gallstone formation. Ileal dysfunction, ileal resection, again an uh, increased amount of stone formation in this case because of intrahepatic circulation. So basically, these are the other metabolic disorders associated with the gallbladder stone disease, right? The second is why do we say it is a metabolic problem? Because the difference in the bile composition and in the hepatic uh, enzyme activity as compared to normal individual. Number one, the bile is increasingly lithogenic. From 25, the bile acid cholesterol uh, ratio from 25 to 1 goes to below 30 is to 1. And that is the time when it gets precipitated. That means low bile acids and more of cholesterol. So why and how? How does this uh, ratio change? Number one, increase cholesterol. That means you are increasing the denominator or you are decreasing the numerator. In either case, from 25 to 1, it is going to come below 30 to 1. And once it comes to below 30 to 1, that is the time when precipitation of the cholesterol occurs. So either increase cholesterol production because cholesterol production is not only at the level of the liver, even the gall bladder has some amount of cholesterol production as compared to a normal in a patient who's got the tendency for cholesterol formation. His gall bladder, his or her gall bladder is producing more cholesterol. And number two, decreased bile salt synthesis because of decreased activity of 7-alpha hydroxylase, which is the breakdown enzyme for the cholesterol, which converts the cholesterol into the uh, bile salts. Decreased activity of the enzyme can be seen when patients with liver drainage, uh, liver damage, patients with increased sucrose intake, ileal excision of polyar gastrectomy or bigotomy. So in all these cases, you can have an uh, increased uh, tendency for uh, formation of stone, right? Now, the third reason why we say that cholesterol precipitation and supersaturation is metabolic, because these stones can be reversed with surgery or with medical therapy. Lithogenic bile is seen to return to normal after cholecystectomy, so increased gallbladder role. Because you have done a patient, you have done a cholecystectomy in a patient, why does this patient or uniformly have increased chance of CVD stone? That's not true. So why? Something has reversed, and that is the bile becomes normal as far as the lithogenicity is concerned, subsequent to cholecystectomy. And more important, medically also you can lead to dissolution of stone, and what do you use? use chirodeoxycholic acid. Remember when we were talking about the, the metabolism last time of the bile acid and bile salts, we talked about the chirodeoxycholic acid. So giving the CDC in a dose of 15 mg per kilogram orally daily for 3 to 6 months, that dissolves a number of stones. But the problem is that these stones reappear. So this is not a permanent, permanent remedy. It does decrease the lithogenicity, but later on the lithogenicity increases again. And then of course the side effects of diarrhea and hepatotoxicity is very much there. Then comes the second part. So first it was the supersaturation of the cholesterol. Now start the crystallization process. So why does it crystallize? There has to be nidus for the crystallization. And what are the nidus? Most commonly inflammation of the gallbladder wall leads to shedding of the cells and around the cell a precipitation may occur. So 
this inflammation in the gallbladder wall leads to two things. Number one, it leads to increased absorption from the gallbladder mucosa, so less availability uh, of the, the bile salts inside the lumen. So that is again ordering the ratio towards less than 30 is to 1. The desquamated cell becomes the nidus. And then because of inflammation, the gallbladder contraction facility decreases, the capability decreases, so there is stasis of the bile. So less ejection fraction. A normal ejection fraction of the gallbladder is between 65% in females, 20% in males, and that forms one of the important investigations in a calculus college study. The stress of bile is also seen after truncal vagotomy. So, epidemiological predisposing factors. So, this is basically the pathophysiology. Now, what are those age groups or what are those disease processes where you find increased incidence of gallbladder stones, which we have already enumerated some? Let's talk about the other ones. Cardiac patients, increased cholesterol in bile in cardiac patients, cirrhosis, drugs like, for example, keftraxone, total parental nutrition, octreotide, neonatal cholestasis. 5% patients with cystic fibrosis after gastrectomy. So these are some of the epidemiological uh, uh, features of a gallbladder stone. Others, rapid weight loss can also give rise to increased amount of stone formation. Reduced physical activity, obesity. Estrogen promotes stone formation. And that is probably the reason why females have an increased tendency for stone formation. Right? This increase of estrogen as in hormone replacement therapy, oral contraceptives, and this is dose dependent. That means the more estrogen you have, the more the chances of having a stone formation. Childbearing lactation decreases. See, in childbearing, the chance of having a stone formation is less. Multiparity increases by estrogen, female sex estrogen. So all these are basically scenarios where you have an increased amount of estrogen and the chance of increased stone formation. First degree relatives, has some degree of genetic predisposition probably yes no we don't know but there is some amount of genetic predisposition to gallbladder stones which now we are starting uh, starting to understand but geographical is very important remember in india it is a gangetic belt right from kashmir down native north uh, the, down up to bihar that whole belt is thickly populated with gall stone formers right kashmir the up belt the bihar belt the, uh, in the world, the native North American Indians are at increased risk for uh, stone formation, right? Now, sorry. Right. So, the risk factor is just uh, a table which enumerates the same thing that we just not talked about. Now, let's talk about the, the natural history. So, 1 to 2% of asymptomatic gallstones become symptomatic per year. Over 20 years, two-third remain asymptomatic that means only one third so if you have a silent stone today your chances of getting a, a, a problem with your stone or a symptomatic stone is only one third that's 33 percent over 20 years that's a very long time that's why they say that as a rule asymptomatic gold stones usually are never advised to be removed except in certain circumstances we'll talk about that later symptomatic stones repeated attacks is a, is a very characteristic feature Stones and cancer association is very important. And what is this association? You have to understand this very clearly. About 75 to 90% of calcium gallbladders, I'm uh, sorry, of carcinoma gallbladders have polyurethacids. That means if I have cancer today, cancer of the gallbladder, chances are that 90% I would be having stone. But the reverse is very, very different. Only 1% of symptomatic stones will de ever develop carcinoma gallbladder. Which means out of 100 patients of, of uh, gallbladder stones, only one would develop carcinoma of the gallbladder. So, remember, if you have carcinoma gallbladder, your chance of having a stone is 90%. But if you have stone today, your chance of developing carcinoma gallbladder is only 1%. Carcinoma gallbladder is 7 times more common in patients with chronic uh, lithiasis, uh, cholelithiasis and chronic cholecystitis. And more common in symptomatic patients as compared to asymptomatic patients. The effects and complications of gallstones, you have biliary colic, acute cholestitis, chronic cholestitis, and we'll talk about that as we go further. Now, what is the biliary type of pain? That is one thing which requires very careful definition. When you say biliary colic, biliary colic, what does it really mean? 
it describes an epic acid now that definition has been given by the rome classification this is rome 4 classification and it describes biliary type pain as a pain in the epigastrium right upper quadrant pain with the following characteristic number one builds up to a steady level and persists for 30 minutes or more number two occurs at different intervals not daily number three severe enough to interrupt daily activity number four not significantly related with bowel movements number five not significantly relieved by postural change or acid suppression now the supporting criteria is nausea vomiting pain reading to the back and pain results in waking up from sleep so this is the rome definition of biliary type pain which is adhered to in various studies like for example suppose i'm doing a study on gallbladder stones and i say to the patient i have biliary pain so what do i mean by biliary pain i have to have some kind of an objectivity to saying that this is a biliary pain so this gives the objectivity to a biliary pain now when you talk about biliary colic 10 to 25 percent of patients with stone would be having biliary colic non-specific symptoms like flatulence dyspepsia food intolerance to fat especially fat now pain in a biliary colic is there for less than eight hours and that eight hours time period is very very important why because that differentiates a pain of biliary colic from a pain of acute cholecystitis. the pain is severe colicky nausea vomiting may or may not be present alternative sites of pain is again very important now you can have the biliary pain starting from the most common site that is the right hypochondrium and epigastrium travel upwards retrosternum travel backwards interscapular travel further upwards right shoulder right scapula then the left hypochondrium and the left lumbar region so all these are areas where you can have the biliary uh, colic pain and it is not that the patient is having left-sided pain the patient says this is not look this is not gallbladder my gallbladder is here i'm having pain on the left side and you're saying it's a gallbladder pain right he was joking now a doctor has to understand that the pain could be reflected in the left side the pain could be reflected in the shoulder we all know that and the left lumbar region and the most problem problematic thing with the biliary colic is that it mimics a cardiac disease and until the advent of ultrasound it was very very interesting until the advent of ultrasound most of these patients were treated as cardiac patients until one fine morning they decided to get an OCG done. Remember I told you about OCG, the redundant investigation, oral cholestogram. One fine morning they decided to do it and that landed up with gallbladder stones. But the problem was 50% only landed up with gallbladder stones. 50% of stones were missed out. So these patients kept on being treated as cardiac patient, cardiac patient, cardiac patient. Once ultrasound came in with the sensitivity of more than 95%, that was the time when everything turned topsy-turvy and diagnosis of gallbladder stone became much more important. If you look at the bacteriology of a gallbladder stone, what are the, the bacteria present in a stone and, of course, in a acute cholestatus? Remember, we just now said that those patients with gallbladder stones are probably those patients which are not associated with uh, infection. But still, if you have a symptomatic gallbladder stone disease or chronic cholestatus, you will find a positive bile culture in 10 to 30 percent of cases. Acute cholecystitis higher, 50 percent would have a positive biliary culture. CBD stores the highest positivity of biliary culture, more common in more than six years of age. So you're looking at the presence of bacteria in these four scenarios in a patient having various presentations of a gallbladder stone disease. The bacteria usually identified, number one, the most common is Enterobacteriaceae, 68%, the E. coli, the Klebsiella, the Enterobacter. We have the Enteropocus, 14%, anaerobes, 10%. These are the bacteroids. Sorry for this uh, typo error. Clostridium, 7%. And rarely the positive, the Strepto, and the negative Pseudomonas, and the fungal, the Candida. These are the, the bacteriological spectrum of the gallbladder stone disease. I think we'll finish here and next time we'll start with acute cholestatus because that would be an extensive lecture. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, you can always come back to me. Thank you.